Hey everyone, how's it going? I've got allergies, and today we're going to be talking about something that you generally want to avoid when flying a plane. Losing control. Now, even though the movie Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift would have you believe that if you ain't out of control, you ain't in control, it is generally best to stay in control of things you drive or fly. It's in that interest of staying in control that we have our subject for today. A plane with a unique solution to a rather common problem with post-war jet aircraft, and specifically jet aircraft with swept wings. That solution, make the wings inverse, and by effect, weirdly wide-looking. This is the Republic XF-91 Thunder Scepter. Now, in early jet aircraft experimentation and design, in an effort to make an aircraft that would break the sound barrier and achieve supersonic flight, a major sticking point that wasn't engine power was drag. The problem was that on your standard aircraft, even one that was equipped with a jet engine, there was a significant amount of drag that was generated from the wings, which would slow the plane down and prevent it from achieving supersonic speeds. On the vast majority of aircraft seen from their inception to about the early 1950s, they have wings that are effectively perpendicular to the fuselage. On slower aircraft, or basically aircraft that use propellers for their thrust, this was generally considered to be the most optimal design for aircraft designers and manufacturers. This didn't stop some from going against the grain and making so-called swept wing aircraft as early as 1905, generally in an effort to increase stability on tailless aircraft. Still, swept wing designs were incredibly uncommon and were generally relegated to small experimental projects. However, as the years progressed and aircraft speeds increased, although not to speeds even close to breaking the sound barrier yet, the significant drag caused by conventional wingtips was acknowledged as a potential barrier for eventually achieving supersonic flight. In 1935, German aerospace engineer Adolf Buesmann would propose at the Volta conference that if the wings were set at an angle instead of being perpendicular, it would reduce the drag in such a significant manner that supersonic speeds could be achieved. However, because aircraft speeds were generally so low in 1935, his presentation effectively meant nothing to the attendees at the time. Still, he would be proven correct just a few years later in 1939 when tests were conducted by Hubert Ludwig that showed a significant reduction in drag on wind tunnel models with swept wings. These results would be communicated to German companies like Messerschmitt and as late war German aircraft began incorporating jet engine technology, aircraft with swept wings started appearing on the battlefield. After World War II ended, with the capture of German technology, data, and their scientists and engineers, the use of swept wing aircraft became more and more common. I should point out that other countries began work on swept wing aircraft before the fall of Germany, but the fall of Germany and the analysis of their experiments and data did accelerate the usage and acceptance of swept wing aircraft. So accelerated, in fact, that late war jet aircrafts like the American P-80, with their more conventional wings, quickly fell out of favor as fighters and would generally be relegated to ground attack roles. In the quest for increased speed, the swept wing concept was here to stay. However, this isn't to say that the swept wing design was flawless. It had a pretty significant design issue that would have fatal consequences. The problem was simply known as pitch up. In these swept wing designs, what would happen was that at low speeds and at high angles of attack, Stagnant air over the wings effectively slid towards the tips and would cause the tips to stall. As the swept wing design meant that the wing tip was often behind the plane center of gravity, the tips generated lift that helped push the nose down instead of up. This, combined with the nose up lift that was generated by the rest of the wing, 
help keep the plane balanced and in control. So when the wing tips would stall and the rest of the wing continued to generate lift, it would lead to the nose of the aircraft suddenly and intensely rising up, which generally then caused the entire aircraft to stall or even begin tumbling uncontrollably. This became such a common issue for one American jet fighter, the F-100 Super Sabre, that this phenomenon is also known as the Sabre Dance. So, in an effort to solve this issue, this is where the XF-91 comes in. It should be noted, though, that the XF-91 was not designed exclusively to solve the Sabre Dance problem, but it rather was designed with that issue in mind. Originally, back in late 1945 and early 1946, the U.S. wanted to follow in the experimental stead of planes like the ME-163 and ME-262 and test out rocket propulsion in addition to jet propulsion. To be more specific, this propulsion combination would be used to try and increase thrust and rate of climb during takeoff. Under the guidance of Alexander Kartvelli and using the American-made F-84, which was also under his watch, as the base for the design, the XF-91 would be made and first flown on May 9, 1949. It would incorporate both rocket thrusters and the turbojet in the tail section, using both or just the rockets on takeoff, and then just the turbojet from there on out as the four installed rockets would burn through their fuel rather quickly. As far as testing of this aspect went, it was pretty successful, and the plane would manage to break the sound barrier in 1951 and could even reach speeds of Mach 1.71 or around 1300 miles an hour with both of these propulsion systems running simultaneously. In more standard situations, or with just the turbojet, it would reach speeds upwards of 984 miles an hour. It really seems as though testing on this mixed propulsion system was pretty successful. And despite having the success, this isn't really what the XF-91 is known for today. The relative success of the mixed propulsion testing has kind of faded into the background because of how it went about solving the whole saber dance issue with its fat wings. As previously stated, the problem was that the wingtips on swept-wing aircraft would stall out, losing the lift effect they had. So, Republic decided to solve this issue by making the wing tips wider than the wing roots. This, in concept, would give them more lift. By doing this, the idea was that the wide wingtips would be able to generate more lift and thus counter the stagnant air, quote-unquote, sliding to the wingtips. In concept, this would make it so that if the wings happen to stall, it would happen more uniformly and would thus not cause any sudden or violent pitching of the nose. This, of course, gave the XF-91 a rather distinct appearance from above. At ground level, it just looks like a normal plane, but from above or below, you see what is effectively an inverse wing plane something that looks rather quirky to those not familiar with it. In addition to the wide wingtips, there were two other fascinating design decisions. For one, the wings as a whole were capable of tilting, just very slightly and just a few degrees either way. The wings could be tilted up for low-speed situations and leveled out during high-speed flight. The other design change was that because the wings were wider at the tips, the landing gear, instead of folding inwards towards the fuselage, it would fold outward towards the wing tips. For all intents and purposes, this landing gear change didn't really matter, but it was still interesting and pretty unique nonetheless. And so, now the question is this. Did this wing design help? The answer is yes, actually. The whole experimental shebang here, the fat wings, the rotating wings, and the mixed propulsion system actually performed quite well. The larger wing tips did seem to work, and the propulsion system, as previously stated, was successful. Still, even though the XF-91 seemed to show a great deal of promise as a jet interceptor, it would not be adopted, and a grand total of just two prototypes would be made. 
The reason for this had less to do with the plane and its performance, and more to do with the U.S. Air Force deciding to just wait a little bit longer for more technologically advanced designs. This waiting proved to be rather fruitful for the U.S. Air Force and planes like the F-106, the F-101, the F-104, the F-4 Phantom II, and the F-5 would all either be introduced or first flown in the mid to late 50s. All of them performing better and lasting a great deal longer than the XF-91 did or would have. Basically, the XF-91 didn't really get a chance to go anywhere because technology was rapidly advancing and the U.S. government knew it would behoove them to just wait a little bit for that better technology to come along. Still, even though it wouldn't be adopted, the XF-91 did get to continue on for a couple years, albeit in a very minor role. With the two prototype models, it would see some use as an experimental platform for a few minor experiments. The first of which was to outfit the prototypes with radar technology in the nose, as was done on other aircraft in the time, and conduct testing on that. The other came as a result of a testing failure. When the second prototype had a rather catastrophic engine failure on a test flight that saw its entire tail basically disintegrate, it would be outfitted with a V-tail to see how that performed compared to a normal tail. Unfortunately, I could not find any data on how it performed compared to a normal tail, though. Eventually, the second prototype would be relegated for use as a crash test simulator before eventually being scrapped. The original prototype of the XF-91 does still exist, though, and is in storage at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. As one final note here, I want to look at how aircraft today deal with the whole saber dance issue. Apart from the XF-91 solution, which we do not see utilized, what solutions are there? There are very simple solutions like wing fences that help prevent the stagnant air from sliding to the wingtip. There are also things like stick shakers and stick pushers that alert the pilot to a potential stall, or outright forcibly prevent a stall, respectively. There are also control canards, slats, and slight twists in the wingtips. To put it simply, we have quite a few ways to prevent the saber dance situation from happening, and the XF-91 solution is not one that gets used. Because of that, the XF-91 Thunder Scepter exists as an interesting little blip in aviation history. A rather unique design that actually performed quite well, but was doomed by the rapid advancement of technology in the late 40s and early 50s that unfortunately made it kind of pointless to pursue further. Alright, and with that, we'll go ahead and end for today. So, thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Personally, I want more fat wing planes. I mean, they just look more fun, and that's what I want out of military aircraft. Fun! Give them fat wings, install some clown horns, replace the missiles with confetti poppers, put kazoos in the engines. I see no issues with any of this. Make the planes more fun, and maybe it'll help out with the military's recruiting problem. But anyway, I hope you liked the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!